spectroscopy and I'll just tell you about the trends in the field um, over the last 20 some years. Um, so um, we were fortunate enough in 2004 to be able to uh, celebrate essentially 20 years of FNIRS and we organized a special issue in the journal NeuroImage and I was astounded with the uh, just the number of contributions. We actually had like 120 articles submitted. So it was a lot of freaking work to um, handle the reviews of 120 articles, and half of them were rejected. But nonetheless, 58 articles are published in this uh, issue. So if you want to know the present state of the art of functional near infrared spectroscopy, just go look at this uh, issue. Of uh, functional near infrared spectroscopy of, of neural image. Um, let's get that. So um, here's the outline. Um, we'll go through this step by step. Um, so we already discussed this. Remember that it's because the absorption length is so uh, short, uh, long. The absorption coefficient is small. The absorption length is long. That we're able to penetrate through the scalpel skull and interrogate the hemoglobin concentrations in the brain. But the scattering really confounds us, right? So that's what we spent the first two hours talking about us, is how do we deal with the scattering so that we can do a more quantitative analysis of the hemoglobin concentrations. So how is that actually going to be used to study brain activity? Right, so brain activity is neuronal activity. Right, so what does neuronal activity have to do with the hemoglobin? Well, whenever you have a neuronal activity, there's vasoactive molecules released from the neurons that act on the smooth muscle cells around arterioles. It causes dilation of the arterioles. And because you've dilated the arterioles, the vascular resistance has dropped, and thus blood flow increases. That blood flow increases. It delivers more oxygenated hemoglobin downstream. And so it's able to deliver more oxygen to the tissue. Right? So why is more oxygen being delivered to the tissue? It's because that depolarization of the neurons requires extra uh, ATP, so you have to increase oxygen metabolism in order to, to produce more ATP to repolarize uh, the membranes of the neurons. And, sorry, and what is the depolarization of uh, neurons? And, uh, neuro I mean, neuronal activity in action potential is related to the depolarization of the neurons. So it's, it's membrane potentials. And, and so in order to restore the ionic concentration gradients following a neuron firing, you know, there's just the, 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 um, the transport mechanisms you know, get more active to restore the uh, and, and ionic that concentration. So does it mean that neurons make any shaking or any motion? Or, mm -hmm. And is it effects of, uh, you know, 
dynamic life cycle. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so where do the ions go? Because uh, no, they're just, do they just intracellular or extracellular, right? Right. So they go in and out. But once it goes back in again, then they're still there. So why do you need this activity to produce more ions? Or did I get you wrong? No, no. So no, it's just transporting the ions back ah, to okay. restore memory. It's just transporting. I got you. It's not making more. It's transporting. Yeah. Okay. But uh, so, sorry again. So <coughs> how do you consider that depolarization? For example, we know that okay, if uh, we consider the optics, we have the electric uh, constant or dielectric constant and magnetic constant that form the refractive index, right? So, and if the depolarization of neurons is changed, does it mean that the effective index of uh, you know, propagation of that whatever is changed as well? So, can we? So, can people we have that? measured optical scattering changes during the run activity. So, it's been measured. It's been reliably measured in isolated nerve preparations, mostly, and a little bit in cortex, but not so much. The signal is very, very weak, um, like three orders of magnitude weaker than the hemoglobin signal, optical signal that we have. So it exists, but it's very weak. I think with OCT, there's potential to actually measure it. We have some preliminary data on it. I think you know, other people have data. It needs to be developed further. Um, but we're just talking about hemodynamics, right? So how does hemodynamics hemoglobin actually reflect neuronal activity. It's because we have this arterial dilation, we also have increased oxygen consumption. The arterial dilation increases blood flow, increases blood volume, delivers more oxygen. The increased oxygen consumption actually consumes more oxygen. The result is that we see an increase in blood flow, an increase in blood volume. We see an increase in oxygenated hemoglobin because the dilation wins and we see a decrease in deoxyhemoglobin. It's really interesting, right? So why does blood flow increase so much to actually increase oxygenated hemoglobin? So that was long debated in the neurovascular coupling community, in the fMRI community. And the answer is actually really simple. In order to support a greater consumption of oxygen, you need to raise capillary oxygen con content to increase that oxygen concentration gradient. And it's only because you've increased that concentration gradient that you're able to support higher metabolic activity. So the only way you can you know, get a larger oxygen concentration gradient is if you increase blood flow more than what you would think would be needed um, normally. Um, that was debated for a long time. So I just gave you an answer that took people 15 years to figure out. <laughs> but I have a question about the significance because this is probably a minor increase compared to the concentration gradient that you get from the consumption of oxygen. So your tissues are devoid of oxygen, and that's going to give you a greater So, right. You could think that tissue change. PO2 is kind of high, maybe. Yeah. And so an increased consumption, tissue PO2 will drop. And so that's another way that the gradient would increase. Absolutely true. The way I said was raise the supply, raise the vessel. PO2. Well, in the brain, you know, the tissue PO2 is kind of low, actually. So you don't want it to drop. You know, unlike other tissue, uh, every other tissue in the body has an oxygen reserve. The brain doesn't. If you cut off the oxygen supply, you know, you will pass out in 20 seconds because the oxygen is depleted very quickly um, in the brain. And another question is when you talk, about this blood flow changes on the arm. So, and when we consider that in the brain, in the arm we have muscle. Yeah. In the brain we, I'm not sure, so, but I assume that we have no muscle. Right. Or my brain is one big muscle. Uh, for some. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> so uh, the question is uh, uh, how the influence of muscles, you know, is correlates with the brain, uh, you know, structure of the blood vessel. Any comments on that? People talk, so muscle has myoglobin, 
um, which acts as an oxygen reserve. People have talked about, maybe they call it neuroglobin. It might exist in the brain. It might be part of an oxygen reserve, but that's kind of only the last few years. Okay, let, let me ask another way. So, is this the muscles, so whatever, motions of collagen fibers, whatever, uh, influence something in the blood flow uh, compared to the brain tissues where it's more, uh, let's say, I would say, uh, not, not so, not I mean, so arterials, arterials, okay, your brain has muscle, right? My brain has muscle, we have smooth muscle smells around our arterials. And so they are active, absolutely. Um, and people do ask that question, what, what impact do they have on oxygen consumption and things like that? I think it's minor, but nobody's actually measured exactly how much. So we all have muscles in our brains. Um, okay, so this was uh, in 1993, the first ethnogenesis experiments were performed. Um, this is the data from um, uh, Villinger's uh, group, um, and they just did frontal lobe um, measurements. They had just a very simple nearest detector on the forehead, and they had the subjects doing some cognitive tasks. They just had to think hard. And so they could see the increase in blood volume and oxyhemoglobin and that characteristic decrease in deoxyhemoglobin. Um, in that same year, also, a gr uh, groups in Japan did the first multiple locations, uh, measuring multiple brain regions, and it was only two years later that um, Hitachi came up with the first imaging system that they, they sell commercially. So I, that was 1993. I started working on this in 98, 97, 98. Um, and you know, the field was quite small. There was, in the first 10 years, only 148 papers. I had read all of them. You know, it was really easy to do that. Um, and it was really quite amazing in that first 10 years, there are already papers exploring a range of different stimuli, visual stimuli, motor stimuli, sensory stimuli, um, psychological language stimuli, cognitive tasks, auditory tasks. There are already papers that were looking at many different uh, neuro-related diseases. Um, there are already many papers with multimodal combinations of ethnears with fMRI and PET, um, lots of instrumentation, um, fast optical signals, they were looking at neuronal activity. It was amazing how much had already been covered, even studies in infants. Um, one, of, uh, one big change in the first 10 years, though, was actually uh, the choice of wavelengths. In the first 10 years, everyone was using 780 nanometers with 830 nanometers. The idea was this isospectic point at 800 nanometers. You wanted to have one wavelength that was shorter to be more sensitive to deoxyhemoglobin, one wavelength that was longer to be more sensitive to oxyhemoglobin. And you wanted the wavelengths, this was the idea, close together so that the scattering would be about the same and so the two wavelengths of light would sample the same volume of tissue. So it made sense. The problem was, it, when you're converting from optical density changes at these two wavelengths to concentration changes, we had to make assumptions about the, this differential path length <coughs> factor. And any small errors in that differential path length factor would be amplified because the differences in the spectra were not that large. Right? So you're very sensitive to systematic errors in your assumption on the differential path length factor. And so we did this experiment where we were using 780 and 830 just like everyone else. We had the source and two detectors over the motor cortex, right? So tapping our fingers, we would expect a localized increase in blood flow and oxygenation in the motor cortex. And those two detectors should pretty much see the same thing. Right? When we looked at the data, you know, oxyhemoglobin showed the same thing. Deoxyhemoglobin for uh, the green line showed the characteristic decrease. But deoxyhemoglobin for the blue channel actually increased and then decreased, which didn't really make sense. I mean, people had been talking about an early dip, that oxygen consumption would increase before the blood flow response, and so you'd see an increase in deoxyhemoglobin. 
but you should also get a decrease in deox in, sorry, you'd see an increase in deoxyhemoglobin, but you should also see a decrease in oxyhemoglobin. But there was no decrease in oxyhemoglobin. So this actually, to me, looked a lot like crosstalk that would happen because of the systematic error of not having the right um, differential path length factors, right? And so sure enough, actually, if you look at this blue channel, you see cardiac oscillations. Cardiac oscillations don't really exist in the deoxyhemoglobin signal. This is clearly crosstalk from the oxyhemoglobin into the deoxyhemoglobin. Okay, and so the only way you could reduce that crosstalk effect is to uh, change your wavelengths, right? And so you had to basically use wavelengths that had a bigger difference in the extinction coefficients of oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. So we did the theoretic uh, analysis. We suggested that you use 690 nanometers with 830 nanometers, and several other people did the same analysis and suggested the same thing, and now actually everyone, most commercial systems are using those wavelength pairs. You could also use 750 nanometers with 830 nanometers because you know, you're right around that, that bump there, so you've got a big, big difference, so that, that works out well. Um, but laser diodes at 750 are not as common as at 690, so that's a little bit more challenging. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. And you show these fluctuations, so in terms of seconds on the top graph. Mm -hmm. So when the, when the uh, heart is pumping the blood, it's minutes, not the seconds. Right? So I don't know what your heart rate is, but my heart rate <laughs> is about is every second. Every second. Yeah. Every second. Yeah. I don't think it will be every second. You can. Uh, 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 Check your pulse on the two or three seconds, but not like. Uh, uh. Okay. Well, I I think normal is sixty to eighty beats per minute, so that's one one point five per second beats. Right. But uh, it, do you consider that the optical properties are changed when the blood is pumping the uh, the you know the arterial blood and. You know, These are very small changes. So it changes absor absorption, absolutely. That's why we see the, those modulations. Okay. Yeah. So you use the shorter wavelength to get a higher sensitivity to the absorption part. But now you've moved the wavelengths away from each yeah. other and you've made it more sensitive to the yeah. scattering and therefore the differential yeah. content factor. Yeah. So we did a lot. So right. These two different wavelengths are sampling different volumes of tissue. So we, we did a lot of analysis on that. Um, we're using fo just Monte Carlo simulations, and the um, it was by far the lesser of two evils that you're you're sure you you're in introducing other biases, but those biases were less evil than the bias of having small differences in the extinction coefficients. Okay. So nothing's perfect, but. This was uh, much better, right? Was, um, okay, so um, the second ten years, the number of papers just continued to grow exponentially. You know, the doubling time is like three point four years. Um, I, I made this figure two thousand twelve. Um, I followed it up now to two thousand fifteen. Two thousand fourteen actually exceeded four hundred papers, so it's still continuing that exponential increase. Increase and. It's no longer possible, sadly, to read all the papers, um, but it's still important to try to keep up. Um, but you know, now you, it's interesting just to look at the trends. Just cognitive, uh, the number of measurements with c papers with cognitive tasks is growing a lot. With neuro um, diseases like schizophrenia and, and stroke is growing. Uh, multimodal with fMRI uh, has many papers. Um, resting state, I don't know if any of you heard of resting state functional connectivity, where you actually can measure brain connections just by having the subject do nothing. Because as you're thinking, it's engaging all of these brain networks. And so just by measuring kind of baseline fluctuations in the brain, you're essentially measuring those baseline networks as a person is thinking. And you can do this just correlation analysis and you can find those networks. So that's been exploding in fMRI and now is exploding in uh, fNIRS as well. And infants is a very important uh, application domain for fNIRS for two reasons. One, it's, you get much more signal from an 
because their heads are smaller, their skulls are smaller. But also, it's very difficult to measure infants with fMRI um, because they don't sit still in a magnet. Um, whereas fMIRS is less constrained by the need to stay still. You can actually have subjects moving around. So lots of studies are being done with infants. So I'll take you through several, several things we've done at MGH. I, I cut out a few of these because uh, at least I want to get to the bar uh, earlier. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I should put my hand there. <laughs> no, I got to ask. So everything you presented so far to me looks totally analogous to fMRI. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And in the beginning, you had the big box overlap. Yeah. And so, are you, if you're not going to show divergence from fMRI, can we say now where you see where there's a dramatic divergence for, from fMRI? I mean, your system presumably is simpler and you have all those kinds of aspects, but in terms of the fundamental information... You yeah, so, I, I, I mean, fundamentally, it's studying populations that you can't easily study with fMRI, and it's using paradigms that you can't use with fMRI. So populations, infants, right? Um, paradigms uh, would be any sort of like natural behavior that you want to study. You can't do natural behavior in a paradigm, right? So I think those are the big uh, examples okay. of, of where ethnos is big, and you're seeing more and more people do those things. Um, I've not been doing those things just because I'm a technology guy and I haven't had the collaborations to develop those things. Um, and so what I'm going to be telling you about are kind of more technology related and physiologically related uh, applications. Um, which, I mean, the physiological applications are another domain. I mean, just kind of, e even though it's kind of similar to fMRI, it actually complements fMRI um, because we get, uh, fMRI has an uncalibrated measurement, I'll do this in more detail later, uh, uh, uncalibrated measurement of deoxyhemoglobin. FNIRS has a different measurement of deoxyhemoglobin. It also has oxyhemoglobin. So combining them together, you get a lot more physiology. There's another question? Yeah. How does it compare in terms of price? To what yeah, well, it's, mu it's much cheaper. Mm -hmm. So, but the images are not as good, right? So I also think there's a, another domain where you could certainly get better data with fMRI for a number of studies, um, but what you'd get with FNIRS would be good enough. Um, and you could study a lot more people, a lot more quickly, a lot less expensively. Um, and so I think that's another good area for FNIRS. But can you get that kind of information from fMRI without stimulations? I mean, I'm thinking of bold when I think of yeah. fMRI, that sort of thing, which is indirect measurements in a, in a fairly contrived uh, set up, which is not quite the same thing. Well, no, I mean, bold is deoxyhemoglobin. Yeah, it's directly. It's the same, it's the same right, but you're stimulating the system in order. You don't no, you have a stimulated change in the. No, no, what do you mean by stimulating the system? The, you're stimulating you the system. You're stimulating the subject. The subjects are stimulated. Yes. No, but it's resting. But likewise, is for ethnomers. Is Can bold be, by definition? Bold, but can, bold, can that, can that so be resting state? Sure, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Resting state. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. I always thought it had to have some disturbance. Yeah. No, 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 I don't. It's just, it's exactly that. It's just, you know, looking at the uh, change that you have in chemical shift as a result of the oxygen state. So it's just oxygen state. And it has all the confounds about blood volume, all those types of things, which I think you guys would have. So, because, so, because so what am I thinking about? Am I thinking about the calibration of fMRI? You might be right thinking about the calibration. Okay. Right. I mean, deoxyhemoglobin is paramagnetic, oxyhemoglobin is diamagnetic. You can change the amount of concentration of them, it changes the effect on the relaxation rate of the spins. So, it, um, more deoxyhemoglobin causes a greater relaxation rate. Right, which would decrease the the fMRI signal, the MRI signal. Right. So when you do a brain activation experiment, you actually decrease the amount of um, deoxyhemoglobin. You actually get more MRI signal. Right? So that's why bold always goes on. So they're just measuring this this uh, T two weighted MR signal. Um, so. The first thing 
or one of the main, one of the important things we did, we've studied a lot of neurovascular coupling. So I, I was hired to go work at the Martino Center where they developed fMRI. And um, they wanted to know what does BOLD actually tell you about neuronal activity? And it was really difficult to answer that question with fMRI. So we could use optical methods. Um, and to answer that question, you need to have the electrophysiological measurements of neuronal activity, and you need to have the measurements of deoxyhemoglobin and relate them and try to understand what is BOLD actually telling us about neuronal activity. So um, Maria-Angela uh, Franceschini uh, did these experiments, and she really addressed which neural components are driving the hemodynamic response. And she did this in animals. I'll show you those results. She also did some human equivalent measurements. Um, in animals, though, the experiments are really nice because the subjects stay still for a very long period of time. Um, and the neuronal signals that you measure with EEG are more their relation to the neural components at the microscopic scale are, are better known. So during a somatosensory stimulus, it was a, a, um, a four-pole stimulus, electrical stimulus to the four-pole. You get inputs to the somatosensory cortex from the thalamus. Uh, where am I? Oops. That was weird. Okay. Um, and then those um, signals, neuronal signals, go from layer four up to the superficial layers. Um, uh, two and three. Yeah. What is the time frame of the signals? So those neuronal signals happen on the time scale of tens of milliseconds, and I'll show you some examples of that. And so she could, uh, so right, it first comes into layer four, then goes up to layers two and three, and so it looks something like this. So that's a, a time scale, you know, it's 100 milliseconds. You get a positive deflection in the, in the potential, negative, and another positive. And then by using a parametric stimulus, um, by changing the, um, basically there's an electrical pulse given for like 300 microseconds, and then it's repeated at four hertz. You can do that for one second, eight seconds. You could change the amplitude of the current, or you could change the frequency. Instead of four hertz, you could do six hertz, one hertz. It changes the neuronal response. You get uh, adaptation, right? So this, this shows you just frequency. So if you do one hertz, so, sorry, is it uniform time? Or I mean, is it like uh, or, 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 or is it changed because of some diseases uh, or something else? So we're just looking at a one cohort of animals. So I'm not addressing the question of disease effects and such. Um, so the this is one hertz. This is just folding the, the four pulses on top of each other. And you can see, basically, the electrical potentials are all the same. Simultaneously, near-infrared spectroscopy measured the, deox the, the hemoglobin response, oxygen deoxyhemoglobin, it's for a four-second stimulus. As you increase the frequency, this would be three hertz, you can see now there's some adaptation going on. You know, that, that N1 is getting smaller and smaller. And as you go to a higher frequency, that adaptation happens much more quickly. Uh, or habituation, um, and at 7 hertz even more quickly. And you can see that even though the number of stimuli is going up, the hemodynamic response is actually going down, right? And it's going down because, as you can see, that neuronal activity is actually going down. So essentially the neurons aren't able to reset in time to respond to the next stimulus. Right? So you, you would expect this sort of attenuation, but what's really nice about this is that this P1 corresponds with the thalamic inputs, and this N1 and P2 corresponds with the superficial neuronal processing. So it allows us now to do a regression analysis to test, is it this P1 that predicts the hemodynamic response? Is it you know this um, N1 and P2 that predict the hemodynamic response, or is it some combination of them? And so it really allows us to answer the question, what part of the neuronal activity is the hemodynamic response actually reflecting? And so you just do that in, in a regression model. And this is the data for different durations. And, and, and all the different colors, uh, the red is the oxyhemoglobin. And then the different colors is either using the stimulus onset, P1, N1, P2, or all the components to predict the hemodynamic response. 
everything predicts the hemodynamic response equally well for duration. Duration is not interesting. When we change the amplitude of the stimulus, we then begin to see that actually P1 doesn't really predict the hemodynamic response as well. You've got to go look at N1 uh, and P2. And for frequency, it was very much the same thing. It's, it was really the N1 that best predicts the hemodynamic response. Okay. So um, what that was teaching us is that it's not the inputs that are derived that cause the hemodynamic response. It's the subsequent superficial cortical cortical signaling that's going on that's really producing the hemodynamic response. That makes a lot of sense because that involves the most synaptic activity is that cortical cortical processing, and so that would be the most energy demanding and require the biggest hemodynamic response. Um, it was also important to understand that because if you actually wanted to use fMRI to kind of look at a healthy brain, you, know, you could actually, if it was the thalamic inputs that drove the hemodynamic response, you could actually have a dead cortex producing a bold response, right? But these results indicate actually no, you need, you need a live cortex that's processing the signal in order to produce that hemodynamic response. Okay. I won't show you these results, but Miranda was very lucky. She had this great medical student that wanted to get some experience and did the exact same experiment with six different anesthetics. So the, quite, the, the original experiments were done under one regimen of anesthesia. So the question always comes up, does anesthesia change the hemodynamic response? So the student did a study with six different anesthetics. And absolutely, the anesthetic changes the hemodynamic response. But it also changes the neuronal response, right? Because the anesthetics act on the neurons. And because the neurons are now affected by the anesthesia, their response to the stimulus is different, right? So that N1, P1, N2, other way around, P1, N1, P2, shape was different. The amplitudes were different under the different anesthetics. But that regression relationship was the same. It didn't change with the anesthesia. Right, so what that taught us was that this neurovascular coupling is not affected by uh, anesthesia. Right? Everyone still complains that you know, neurovascular coupling is affected by anesthesia. What they really mean is the hemodynamic response is affected by anesthesia, but also the neural response is affected by anesthesia. The coupling is not affected by anesthesia. Right? So it's still a valid point. If you want to study normal neuronal activity, you shouldn't be anesthetized, right? Because that's not normal. You're not, well, some of you who've been drinking, maybe your neuronal activity um, is a little different. But uh, in general, um, I set you up for that. That was a long time coming. It's pointing at us. Okay, so the, um, the next thing was you know, when I first went to Martino Center, um, the fMRI guys, they wanted me to do f meters at the same time as fMRI to better understand bold. So we did a ton of experiments uh, where we coupled the meters into the magnet with the subject. It was easy to do um, because the meters is just using glass and plastic fibers that don't interfere with the magnetic field. So you could get simultaneous fMRI and mirrors. This is Ted Huppert, who did um, a lot of this work uh, when he was a student. Um, he did a great job. And um, basically using this probe with four sources surrounded by eight detectors, put over the motor cortex. So the motor cortex is here. Sensory cortex is, is here. And you know we, we like doing this finger tapping task. It was easy. And so um, it gives you a localized decrease indicated by blue and deoxyhemoglobin. And so we were able to measure that at the same time as bold. Um, and so you see, you know, bold goes up, as I was saying, because, um, you know, as the amount of deoxyhemoglobin decreases, you have less paramagnetic uh, deoxyhemoglobin, and it allows the MR signal to increase because the relaxation time gets longer. Yeah. The question is, uh, when you spoke 
I mean, previous picture, yeah. you show us uh, when you do the measurements when the people are sitting or not sitting, and here we see the different position yeah. of. So and I assume that the brain, when you have a different position, also changed the some. I don't know the uh, let's say geometrical position. So how can you comment on about that? Yeah, how I mean we were. We often worried about lying down versus sitting up during these studies, but the only factor we came across that seemed to be related to sitting up or lying down was actually these low frequency oscillations that we see, and I'll come back to that later. Okay. What I mean is if you have the, uh, the fixed position of soul sense detector, and if the brain physically changed yeah. you know, a bit, one centimeter, I don't know, two centimeters or maybe less than that. So how do you really know that you measure the well, same? I, mean, uh, I think yeah. the brain is in a sack of water in, in, a, yeah, it's, in it's, the brain. It's, it's, it's kind okay. of mutually buoyant. So I don't I don't think there's much of a geometrical change. But actually, in a UCL, David Delphi considered the case that the brain is uh, like sort of iceberg. Yeah, yeah, yeah but the, nobody the, really worries about that. So I think it was kind of a non-issue. So the um, what we, we we just wanted to really find out this relationship between deoxyhemoglobin and bold. So if you just normalize everything, you know we could very clearly see that the bold and the deoxyhemoglobin were really strongly correlated. The oxyhemoglobin actually increases first. So this is an interesting you know uh, series of events that's going on, right? So you have um, their own activity, it releases vasoactive agents that act on the smooth muscle cells of the arterioles, they dilate. So you get an increase in blood volume, so you see you have more arterial hemoglobin, so total hemoglobin goes up. As that goes, as that dilates, blood flow increases, and, and so actually ASL is the fMRI measurement, arterial spin labeling, it measures blood flow. So you see that blood flow goes up at the same time very promptly. But as that goes up, it washes in more oxyhemoglobin. So you see more oxyhemoglobin washing into the capillaries. It takes time for that oxyhemoglobin to wash out the deoxyhemoglobin from the veins. It takes the transit time of blood through the capillary network, it's like a two seconds or so. And so that's when we see that deoxyhemoglobin, remember, is going down, is delayed by one or two seconds as it's washed out of the, the capillaries and the veins. Right, so that all of that makes sense. So this really kind of established the temporal relationship between bold and fMRI uh, and, and, and F nears. Um, we did a spatial comparison as well. So the nears were making measurements with these channels between you know a source and detector makes a channel. FMRI you get an image. So it was hard for us to take the nearest measurements to make an image to make a spatial comparison with fMRI. So what we did instead was we took the image from fMRI, projected it to predict a nearest measurement. Right? So we did the spatial comparison in the nearest channel. This is for five different subjects. And you can see that the space, there was a very strong spatial relationship between deoxyhemoglobin and the bold signal. Right? Every subject was slightly different, but there was always a strong correlation. Likewise, for the arterial spin labeling, oh, I should point out, just you see here, the spatial correlation was 0.68, but for oxy and, de and total hemoglobin, it was 0.38. So it was really a much better spatial uh, correlation with deoxy. When we look at our arterial spin labeling, which is measuring blood flow, which we expect to better reflect total hemoglobin, um, sure enough, we saw that the spatial correlation was best with total hemoglobin. So that all, is all working. So we have, you know, this, we, we've kind of validated, we cross-validated bold and FNIR, so we want to do something more. What can we do more that was hard to do with them individually? So I was interested in the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen. Um, it's a simple mass balance. I'm a physicist, I like simple, I like mass balance. Um, you know, you, deliver oxygen on the arterial side, oxygen leaves on the venous side, the difference is what's consumed by the tissue. So that's just 
blood flow times an oxygen extraction fraction. Um, historically, this oxygen consumption is measured by PET. It's very difficult. The spatial and temporal resolution is not very good, and not many people do it in the world. It's very because it's so difficult. If you had O17, you could do MR spectroscopy. This would be a really easy way to measure oxygen consumption, but it costs about two thousand dollars per measurement because O17 is so rare. Uh, so that's not going to happen much. Um, so people are using MR uh, alone, and people are developing methods to get baseline oxygen consumption. You already have blood flow, so we just need an MR method to measure oxygen extraction fraction. Some methods are being developed. I think someday they'll be successful at it. But early on, starting in 98, they rewrote this equation to look at changes in oxygen consumption during brain activation. And so you could estimate changes in oxygen consumption if you had changes in blood flow, changes in deoxyhemoglobin. You get that from BOLD and ASL. You just have to calibrate the BOLD, as I was alluding to. Um, but you didn't have total hemoglobin concentration, so what they did is they make an assumption about the relationship between total hemoglobin and blood flow. So they have an assumption. But if we bring in NEARS, we get the change in total hemoglobin concentration. We also get a change in deoxyhemoglobin that doesn't need to be calibrated like the, in the same way that the bowl does. Um, so they can, are complementary here. So we should be able to get a better estimate of oxygen consumption where we have good spatial from fMRI, good temporal information from NEARS. Um, so we spent a number of years working on that. We developed a multi-compartment uh, Winkessel model, um, just describing the effects of arterial dilation on oxygen consumption on the transport of oxygen. Um, really just did that with a set of coupled differential equations, where we have a driving function for the arterial dilation, a driving function for the oxygen consumption. So, you know, it's a circuit. Blood flow is just described by a circuit. So you can write down these circuit equations for the blood flow. We, you know, introduce a resistance decrease in the arterioles. And then you just have to have oxygen diffusing into the tissue where it's consumed by the mitochondria. Yeah, sorry, sorry yeah. about this model. So when you can see that the blood flow in the artery, arterioles, and, uh, yeah. and when. So why uh, the same resistance or not maybe the same is applied for that model. So because uh, we know that in arteries they have some uh, you know uh, special membranes that might uh, stop or open you know the blood flow. But it's in the capital loops they completely different vessels and sometimes they have even no the uh, boundaries. They could be opened and closed uh, with no, let's say. So you're uh, describing the skin, vessels. which is completely different than brain. I see. You, you're talking about the brain. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. The brain vasculature is very different than that. Um, so okay. So we use that model then to fit these data. So we're able to fit the data very well, and out of that fit, we get an estimate of oxygen consumption with unprecedented spatial and temporal resolution. So we're like, woohoo! Um, but it turned out to, it's a difficult experiment, so not much is going to be done with this. So we have a great tool. Uh, um, so, you know, that was cool, but uh, what's its impact going to be? Well, I think its impact now that some time has passed and I feel better, um, <laughs> is to actually teach us about calibrated bold, right? So calibrated bold is also difficult, not as difficult as doing bold and years at the same time, um, but it has some assumptions, and people aren't comfortable with those assumptions. So we can actually investigate, are those assumptions okay? Because now we have kind of the traditional way of calibrating bold, in order to estimate oxygen consumption changes, and we can compare that against our multimodal way of fusing things together, right? So the way you calibrate bold is you have to do this hypercapnic calibration. So you do, you breathe CO2, which raises blood flow in the brain, but it doesn't change <coughs> oxygen consumption. So because you raise blood flow, and oxygen consumption is constant, 
I mean, you're also gonna, you're gonna get a change in deoxyhemoglobin. You're gonna get a change in the pulse signal. So that allows you to um, estimate this M parameter. That's the calibration. You also have this alpha and beta parameter um, where uh, alpha is actually that assumed relationship between blood flow and blood volume. So that's another pro parameter we have to um, assume and, and, and validate. Beta is actually an intrinsic parameter about the effect of paramagnetic deoxyhemoglobin on the relaxation rate of the, bolt of the uh, MR signal. Okay, so how are we going to do this fusion? So we can get fancier, right? So the, um, we can form an image with NEARS data. I didn't describe this uh, the first two hours. Um, sorry about that. But um, if we have measurements at two wavelengths, we can get a spatial spatial image of oxine deoxyhemoglobin by using those photon migration profiles, right? And it's just a linear relationship between the, remember that banana pattern I showed you? It, um, it's just a linear relationship. It, you take that banana pattern integrated over the change in oxine deoxyhemoglobin and all of those voxels, it predicts exactly what the change in the optical density would be at the corresponding wavelength. So it's a, it's a linear equation relating that. So you just got this nice linear relationship between the measurements at each wavelength and the spatial changes in oxygen deoxyhemoglobin. So bold actually gives us a change in deoxyhemoglobin at each spatial location. Right? And, and ASL gives us a spatial measurement of blood flow, which we can relate to blood volume. So I could re rewrite that as uh, ASL is related to uh, a change in a total hemoglobin. Okay, so this is bold, that's ASL. I can put it into this linear equation where now I no longer, you know, here I had a spatial convolution for the optical measurements. For the MR measurements, I don't have a spatial convolution. I just have these identity matrices. Right? So the bold and ASL actually spatially constrain the measurements of oxy and deoxyhemoglobin which then allows the optical information to provide uh, more accurate information about the amplitude of the changes in oxygen deoxyhemoglobin. So that's the idea, right? O optical is not good spatially, but is good with the concentrations. MR is good spatially, but is not good with the concentrations. So by fusing it together, we should get the best of both worlds. Um, so, you know, by simulation, if we just do an optical image reconstruction, um, that circle is where this activation should be. So you see we get a bigger blob, um, the optical reconstruction. If we use bold, you see it spatially constrains deoxyhemoglobin. It doesn't spatially constrain oxyhemoglobin. When we add in the ASL, we get a spatial constraint of both. It's not shown in this figure, but also the amplitudes are more accurately reconstructed. So we wanted to do that experiment. We can skip that detail. So the basic idea is, in the magnet, we're going to do nears and bold at the same time. Um, you're going to have uh, finger tapping for the brain activation measurement. Um, and we're going to use that data uh, um, to use the fusion model to essentially test the calibration of bold. Then we're going to do the classic measurement of hypercapnia, which calibrates bold. So then we can compare the classic calibration against our, our different calibration approach. So um, during the finger tapping tasks, you know, the bold and ASL signals look like this, um, and the, the near signal looks like that. Temporally, spatially, the MR signals look like that. That's where the activation is in the motor cortex. During hypercapnia, um, it increases blood flow everywhere, which will uh, increase bold everywhere. We only measured um, five layers in the upper part of the brain near the motor cortex. Um, we didn't measure the whole brain, so that's why you only see the changes up there. Okay. Looking at the image results for the finger tapping, we did eight <coughs> subjects. You can see these are the image results for oxyhemoglobin for the eight subjects. And out of that fusion model, I'll just back up a few slides. Remember, in this fusion model, there's actually a parameter M there. So this this is a linear problem except for M. So we had to solve this problem iteratively to find the M that gave us the best fit to the data. 
So M, which is the calibration of bold, right, this is M, um, comes out of this fusion um, estimation. So we got M for many different, um, for the eight subjects, and it was all over the place, you know, from 0.03 up to 0.11. It was quite interesting. There's actually a number of papers in the literature where people actually discuss what value of M should be used for each brain region. But here we are, the same brain region, but there's, you know, a fourfold difference across subjects. So it doesn't really make sense to use a single M value. I, I, I should have told you M is actually related to the a volume fraction of blood, and it's related to the baseline uh, oxygen extraction fraction. It's also related to the orientation of the blood vessels relative to the magnetic field. So all of those parameters within a given brain region will vary across um, subjects. But yeah. when we find magnetic field, is the blood flow is changed? I, mean, I don't think so. Maybe if you enter the magnet really fast, um, well, which no. will induce neural currents and maybe make you throw up, then there could be a <laughs> blood flow change. No, but I think you have magnetohydrodynamic effects in the heart in super high fields, yeah. but yeah. you're not going to yeah. see it in the brain. I mean, in the early days when I was playing with magnets, I would say, take this quarter, drop it, cool, drop it again, and then I'd get nauseous, but I was angry. <laughs> but that's a different story. Um, <laughs> it is really cool, if you ever get a chance, drop a quarter. Which side does it land on? Don't. Yeah. Do you have they any? Don't know yeah. what the quarter is. Oh, sorry. Any coin. <laughs> <laughs> a euro. A euro. <laughs> Take a coin. Drop it in a magnet. Which side does it land on? Depends on the magnet. <laughs> I would say it's not the one with the queen's head because she abdicated from. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll give you a hint. It's a trick question. It lands on its side. It lands on its side. Every time. Every time it lands on its side. So we'll talk about it over beers. Um, it's very cool. It's a lot of fun. Try it. <laughs> so, how much does that magnet cost that you're dropping these quarters? <laughs> a million dollars. Two million dollars. You could do it with cheaper magnets. I'm sure, right? So, <clears throat> we got uh, M from our fusion model, and we got M from the traditional um, MR calibration. And you can see that there's a good correlation between the two different methods. So that's giving us confidence that the classical way of calibrating bold um, is, is, um, is valid. Um, and then also calculating CMO2, we could calculate the change in CMO2 using the fusion model versus the classic hypercapnia model. Very good correlation. What was really curious though is the slope is not one. Um, the classic way of doing it with MR actually is underestimating CMO2 changes relative to what we measure with the NEARS approach. Um, and if I have time, I'll come back to that later. Okay, let's see where we end up next. Um, I'm, let me skip ahead. Uh, yeah, let me skip ahead. It's all great stuff, but uh, it's getting late. Okay, so something else with brain activation is um, motion artifacts. So um, this was one ch technical challenge we wanted to start dealing with uh, recently. Um, we have these probes that hold the fiber optics. Uh, on the head, um, but if you move rapidly, you know, the fibers move relative to the scalp, um, it introduces a motion artifact. It can cause you, if that happens during a task, it, it corrupts the data and you got to throw away the data from the task, essentially. Um, so we can either develop probes that have less motion artifacts, or we can develop algorithms to correct the confounding motion artifacts. So we've been working on both. So um, we worked a little bit on a gluon fiber. This was kind of cool. I was working in the epilepsy monitoring unit. I skipped over those, those slides. And they, they have patients who come in for a week. They're taken off of their epilepsy um, medicine um, so that they will have a seizure while in the hospital. 
while they're being monitored with EEG. And the idea is these are patients who are being considered candidates for surgery. They want to try to localize where the seizure is happening. Um, so they use the EEG. The EEG, the electrodes stay there for a week. Um, so how do they stay there for a week? They actually glue them to the scalp using collodion. So we thought, well, let's try the same thing with the optical fibers. So we made these very small uh, optical fibers. Um, there's a photo of it. And we could glue them onto the head. And so we did this nice experiment. Um, I was the first subject. We glued fibers uh, into one side of my head, as you can see there. And then I had a normal fiber optic probe on the other side of my head. And then I moved my head in many different ways. Um, you know, reading, nodding, um, up and down, sideways, twisting my body, uh, raising my eyebrows, it tends to be the biggest motion artifact. And so you can see in green the motion artifacts that were occurring when I did each of these with the normal probe, and in the red is with the gluon fibers. And you can see with the gluon fibers, the sensitivity to the motion artifacts was uh, dramatically uh, reduced. <coughs> right? So um, this just puts it in standard deviation terms of the signal. So if you actually have the time to glue fibers into your subject's head, um, you can really dramatically reduce sensitivity to motion artifacts. And so if, if you want to do experiments where, um, well, we're doing um, measurements on patients having the seizures, so there's a lot of motion there, and we wouldn't, and this enabled us to get data when we otherwise would not have gotten data. But if you want subjects to be maybe <coughs> or just behaving in a natural environment, you know, this is probably a good thing to consider doing to make your probes more stable. So it increase the, the versatility. The, I mean, well, the measurement time is the same. The time to glue the fibers in maybe takes, you know, half an hour or so. When you, when your fiber do the actual measurements, what is the actual time? I mean, that depends on the experiment you set up. So that could be anywhere from five minutes to five days. Uh, depending on the type of experiment you're doing. But you, you, you don't consider that to say half the So the heart is beating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you hold. No, what I mean is so the time of measurement it are not linked or somehow related to the time of uh, half the I mean, the measurements last for several minutes, and the heartbeat is every second. Except yeah. you, I think, is every two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he was referring to gating. No? Wait, do you no, what gating I mean is, okay, so I, I, I can explain. So, yeah. we work with some companies who, who develop the sensors that want to consider, you know, how your heart uh, are changed with some exercises, with some eating, with them. So, and my simple question, so, uh, because there is a Oh, no, so we, we get all that data. I mean, you, you see the pulse waveform, right? So, absolutely, if you want to, if you're interested in how that pulse waveform changes over the course of a day, this is a great measurement tool. We're measuring no, brain no, activity, no, so we always filter out the When the person is signal. moving, yeah. the motion of the, in the person, in terms of frequency, is absolutely the same as the frequency of heart beat. Yeah. And to differentiate this, it's impossible to really. well, So if you design a probe like this, that would really... You can do that. Yeah, I think you could do it. Yeah. I think well, you could do it. Yeah, yeah. But it's very simple to do. And, you know, there's... This was a serious consideration with the epilepsy patients, is if you need to quickly remove the fibers, because, I mean, actually, you can't remove the fibers with the, you need to use the solvent. If you have the solvent, the fibers fall right off. But, you know, if they have to be rushed somewhere, you, they don't have time to get the solvent. Um, so we told them they could cut our very expensive fibers. Um, but it, the short of it is there, there's this beautiful solvent that just makes the fibers fall, fall off. Um, yeah. That was my question. Yeah, it was your It's the gauze that you're picking out of your hair for days afterwards. Um, <laughs> so, um, all right, let's get that. So, motion correction. Um, there's actually, the last few years, um, several methods have been proposed 
so that if you have motion artifacts in your data and you don't want to throw away the trials, um, because your trials are, are your data, right? You don't want to throw it away. You want to try to save it. Um, then, then various methods can try to correct the motion artifacts to recover the underlying signal. Um, so I'm not going to show you any of these details, but suffice it to say there's many different ways of trying to correct the motion artifacts. But then you have to come up with an objective way of deciding which method is the best way to choose for your data. Because depending on the experiment, you'll have different types of motion and effects, and which method you use um, may be more or less appropriate for those motion artifacts. Um, so there's been, the last few years, a lot of um, really good progress there, so that you can recover like half of your trials, um, and that's a really big deal. Now, something I think uh, e Igor has been asking about is, is just other systemic fluctuations, right? So it's not just brain activity, and it's not just resting brain function. Um, we have to deal with cardiac fluctuations, we have to deal with respiratory fluctuations. I was showing you that before dinner. But even worse are these lower frequency fluctuations um, that are called Mayer waves, or maybe they're vasomotion. They got a 10, 20 second sort of frequency. There's just natural variation in the blood pressure, um, which causes natural fluctuation in oxyhemoglobin. On the same sort of time scale that um, our hemodynamic response is happening at. And so that really reduces the efficiency with which we can measure brain activity. Uh, and and what's, what's just worse and, and hard to understand is some subjects you don't really have it, and other subjects you do have it. And kind of relating to what you were asking before about sitting up versus lying down. The other question. So when you're talking about the blood pressure fluctuations, are they happening in a particular part of the brain? Or they, we can see any uh, area of the brain where they are not easy to see the, you know, the changes of blood fluctuations or something, something like that. Where the, it's more stable areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, there hasn't been many papers. So, so it definitely varies in different locations on the head. Is it systematic across all the subjects? I don't think we know yet. Like, can you say the fluctuations are larger in the midline versus lateral region? I don't know yet. I think we'll know soon. Just, it's easy to get the data, just nobody ever analyzed the data that way. Um, so that interferes, though, with how well you can estimate the underlying brain activity. So we need a way to deal with that. And so there's this um, very clever idea proposed by um, Andrew Berger and his group, and uh, Kwan Zhang and Gary Strangman as well, that you know they realize those confounding fluctuations at those low frequencies are largely from the scalp, because our nearest measurements are much more sensitive to the scalp than they are to the brain. Um, and so, if we had a signal from the scalp, we could regress that out of, of the signal from the brain um, and, 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 and get a better estimate of the underlying brain activity. So, let me say that again. So, we use a short separation that only measures the scalp. The long separation measures the scalp and the brain, right? So, the scalp has confounding signals. So, we can use the short separation measurement to regress out the confounding signal from the long separation measurement. And so in their paper, they have a beautiful image depicting this. This is uh, the um, this is the long separation measurement. This is the short separation measurement. And so at each one of these locations is a brain activation task. You know, so it's not evident here in the data that there's a brain activation task. But when they regress out the short separation measurement, you're left with what is nominally the brain signal. And you can very clearly see for every trial that classic brain activation measurement where red oxyhemoglobin goes up, blue deoxyhemoglobin goes down. Right? So that is seemingly just a very powerful approach to um, filtering out this physiological contamination so you could get a more powerful estimate of the underlying brain activation. So we were excited about that, and we, we developed this further. Um, we advanced our probes 
So we typically had large, long separations, three centimeter separations between sources and detectors, but we needed to add in a short separation measurement. So we added in these small fibers for detectors that we'd place eight millimeters away from the sources that would give us a measurement of the, the scalp hemodynamic activity. So we've, um, we've done a lot of measurements. We've done a lot of Monte Carlo simulations. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the shorter, of course, the less deep you penetrate. Uh, so could you use 10, could you use 15? Probably, but I feel I have seen brain activation signals <coughs> at 15. And even at 10, I was not comfortable. So I felt better with it. It, it also, it just, it worked well in, in that probe, so. There must be some kind of optimum, mm. though, right? Because if you do one, which... I would have no problem with two or three or four. Yeah, no, but, it was right. close. But then it's the fraction of the scalp that's in that signal versus the one which is the long, right? So uh, if there's any differential across the scalp, you know... I, I would be perfectly happy with two millimeters. It was just, we, we, would, we have to engineer new fibers, and we haven't done that. Right. So, so I, I, scalp's that constant? It, scalp varies, right? But, That's what I'm saying. But, even, but sorry, even with this 8 millimeters, why should I use that versus this versus this versus this, right? They're going to be different, right? Yeah. So at the end of the day, I said, well, you know, I'd rather just have a small fiber that does both. And so I'm happy with 2 millimeters. So I, I think that would be the optimal solution to do something like that. Um, okay, so um, I will show you now an example application we've been working on that also would not have worked if we didn't have that short separation regression. So measuring pain uh, in the operating room. This is an interesting problem I've been taught about. Um, if you have a surgery, you get anesthesia often, um, but you also get analgesia. So anesthesia just knocks you out. If you just get anesthesia and you don't get analgesia, uh, you're gonna f your body will feel pain. You won't remember it. You will never be aware of it. But your body remembers it, right? And, and it can lead to serious consequences of neuropathic pain. You know, just imagine if your body goes through. I mean, if you're conscious and somebody cuts you, I mean, you remember it well, right? Well, if you're not conscious, you don't remember it, but your body still remembers the experience. Uh, and, it, and it can have serious consequences. And so anesthesiologists need guidance on whether or not they're using a sufficient amount of analgesia. And so they monitor blood pressure, they monitor heart rate. Um, it would be nice if we had a more objective measure. Um, so there have been a lot of studies with fMRI. They know the brain centers that respond to painful stimuli versus non-painful stimuli. But you can't take an MR machine into the operating room. But you can't bring meters into the operating room. Right? So we wanted to show that we could differentiate with NEARS um, uh, a brain response to painful stimulus versus non-painful stimulus as a first step towards then trying to bring this into the operating room. Um, so the brain, we know from fMRI, responds to painful stimuli um, uh, uh, in the somatosensory cortex um, as well as the frontal cortex. So we designed a probe to look at the somatosensory cortex as well as the sensory cortex. All of our analyses, most far, so far, is on the somatosensory cortex. We're beginning to analyze the frontal cortex. We were using an electrical stimulus. Um, and you could just change the current so that the subject either calls it a 3 out of 10 and not painful, or a 7 out of 10 and it's painful. Uh, and, um, right. So the, the key thing is this electrical stimulus was presented for five seconds at either a painful setting or a non-painful setting and it was repeated every 30 seconds or every 25 seconds um, and interleaving the painful and non-painful. And yet, uh, so then I'll show you some group average results. So here's, we also had the subjects do finger tapping because that motor area is right next to the sensory area so we expected spatially that the Finger tapping response should be um, spatially similar to the response that we saw to the painful and non-painful stimuli. So that's what we see is spatial localization, finger tapping, spatial localization for the noxious <laughs> stimulus. 
This is averaged over 11 subjects. Um, and then looking at the hemoglobin response to the noxious stimulus in red, and which is the painful stimulus, and the non-painful stimulus in blue, we see that the response to the painful stimulus was larger. Okay? This is in the group average data. But if you look at the individual subjects, painful versus non-painful, for every subject, it was larger in oxyhemoglobin as well as for deoxyhemoglobin. So it really suggests that at the single subject level, we could imagine actually doing this paradigm in the operating room. So the idea would be every 20 minutes or so, the anesthesiologist would present this three-minute trial which interleaves painful and non-painful stimuli and then looks at the hemodynamic response. And the idea would be if there's sufficient analgesia, there will be no difference in the response amplitude for the painful stimulus and the, and the non-painful stimulus, right? Because the analgesia will make it such that the brain never feels the pain. So do, do you yeah. think that conscious pain versus unconscious pain is going to be the same? So, so do you think that the same level of yeah. pain? Well, no, conscious. conscious right, right, right. So excellent question. So my colleague is a pain specialist, and so <laughs> the, the, um, I'm not. Um, but I understand from him that, you know, just with anesthesia, um, it, uh, the brain will still process the painful stimulus as a painful stimulus, right? even though you're unconscious. Was it and so there must be fMRI data. Or it must be with fMRI data. Right? Um, I haven't read the papers myself. I'm just trusting him. Um, uh, but, and, and he's done these studies and we're doing them with fMRI and we're now doing that with, with fMIRS. We're going to give the subjects uh, morphine, right? And so that blocks the painful stimulus, right? And so we already have preliminary data that shows that the brain response reverts to a non-painful stimulus. I still think that you need some kind of a control where you definitely have a pain but no conscious. Yeah, no, that's what. Otherwise, if it's just you know data that you can say. Yes. Yeah, yes. So yeah. Yeah. No. So we're doing pain, step by step. Painful. We're doing. We are getting to that. But forgotten. So. So if you review our grants, so maybe you'll you'll improve it, so we can do that study. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, we said that when a patient is under anesthesia, uh, the hemodynamic response is lower than when he is not. So will the signal be enough? I mean, we, to, to be able to say... Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is really good question, so we have to address this. Did we say it was lower? Well, because under anesthesia, you, your brain works less. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's less blood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't know it, if maybe... It's not obvious to me that it's always lower, right? So, but, but nonetheless, it's confounded, right? So absolutely. We have to worry about that. So, all good points. So we have to address. Can you do it in animals? I haven't. No. Yeah. Because yeah. you can't really. I guess there's no way to get a protocol approved to create a painful experience for a patient. Well, no. This is a painful stimulus. Well, it's, it's not it's surgically open. Yeah, 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 I know. But uh, to put an unconscious person. No, my colleague he gets it right. No, we're giving. It's, it's at, I have another colleague who's actually done loss of consciousness in the fMRI scan, mm -hmm. which is a really difficult protocol to do, uh, because the confines of the scan would be much easier to do with fMRIs. So they, they do study that. And, the, and those people who are able to control the emotions, or let's say feeling of pain, yeah. so do you think uh, if you will measure them? So the results will be different. I don't know. See, these are all good studies that people could do with F names. Do you think you could measure the same thing in spine? People do study spine. People are studying spine responses, yeah. yeah. But I, I haven't followed the field. Any questions? When you say spine, you're, you're stimulating in the spine and measuring in the brain. Is that is that right? No, it's measuring in the spine. People measuring, measuring in the spine. spine. People okay. are measuring in the spine. And by the way, from your experience, what is the best stimulation of the Fingers? 
This was another interesting, we actually collected data for 12 minutes and we, because we thought, well, we average more, the signal will be better. And we got no signal. And then I was about to give up in the first year of the four-year grant. Um, and, uh, but Miriam Musel, uh, she said, well, we really want to just look at the first three minutes. That's what we want in the operating room. She analyzed the data in the first three minutes and we got the results I showed you, right? But if we analyze the same data for 12 minutes, we get no good result. So why was that? So we looked at the first three minutes in blue versus the second three minutes in red. For a non-painful stimulus, the results are the same. For a painful stimulus, you get habituation. So the brain actually adapts to the painful stimulus, gets used to it, and responds to it as if it's a non-painful stimulus. It kind of makes sense. I think if somebody keeps hitting you after three minutes, <laughs> you don't feel it anymore. <laughs> so it, it kind of made sense. <laughs> you need to find some new colleagues. <laughs> um, so that was really interesting to see. So, all right. This is now looking at the long separation channels and the short separation channels. So I, I, we also had short separation measurements, right? So this is trial averaged. Um, and you can see, you don't see obvious brain activation. And you see short separation. The scalp responses look just like the longer channel responses. Right? So this really suggested to us that all we're seeing here is some systemic response to the painful stimulus. Right? That we're not actually seeing brain activity. So when we do the short separation regression, you know, there's without short separation regression. When we do the short separation regression, you get the localized response. Right? So it was really important to have those short separation measurements in this case to filter out or regress this scalp signal, right? Because when you get a painful stimulus, your heart rate goes up, you get an autonomic response, you actually get vasoconstriction, because maybe you need to run away. So you gotta take all the blood from the skin, send it to the muscles so you can run away. It produces a very complex hemodynamic response in the scalp. You know, it makes sense. Um, but by using that short separation regression, we're able to see that localized um, brain activity. Okay, so, um, <laughs> Did anybody see Minority Report as an old movie? Well, we, we saw the exact same picture on another person's slide. So. <laughs> <laughs> that was one day? Who did that? I don't remember. So you was, oh, you did that. That was. That's what we did. It could happen. Ethnears could see the future. Um, <laughs> could That's happen. exactly what I said. Yeah. <laughs> I really got to end now, don't I? Um, okay, so for the next 20 years, if we're ever going to achieve this predicted reality, um, you know, we, we need a, a strong community, you know, spanning all this uh, many disciplines. Um, it's been really nice over the past few years seeing the growing number of papers, and there's a growing number of companies building commercial systems to support the research community. We've had lots of advances in probe design, and st still more advances are needed. There's software packages you can download, so it's really easy now to get into this field, because you can commercially buy the instruments, the probes, you can get free software to help you analyze the data. There's lots of um, free softwares. Um, one thing I was, uh, I'm proud of is um, I was running a course, and still running a course every year to train people and it started in 2001. Um, and in 2010, to celebrate 10 years of that, we ran a conference 
and we thought, well, we'll have the course, 20 people will come to that. If I invite 30 other people to the conference, we'll have 50 people, that will be a successful conference. Um, and we actually had 150 people come to the conference. Um, so then we ran it again in London, and we had 250 people. Uh, and then um, started a society to oh, can, um, facilitate more conferences. We had 300 in Montreal, and in October we'll be in Paris. So if you're interested in FDNR, hopefully I'll see you in Paris. Um, there's, there's, I think, 280 abstracts submitted. Um, so it would be a great meeting. Um, I have one more thing, which I could stop. I could just stop there. Just stop there. Stop there. Stop there. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs>
a few interesting things pop out. First of all, you know that the largest draining veins are always around 65% oxygen saturation. It's really quite remarkable. You know, uh, one-year-olds, 20-year-olds, uh, rodents, piglets, just everybody's kind of pegged here, and you're at all different length scales. So it really indicates that there's a, a mechanism dr driving kind of angiogenesis to kind of target um, this oxygen extraction fraction. That's one interesting thing. Another interesting thing is that uh, before you reach the capillaries, you've already delivered half of the oxygen to the tissue. Right? So textbooks say oxygen is delivered to the tissue by capillaries. Right? Literature has plenty of examples of oxygen being delivered to the tissue by arterioles. Um, but textbooks don't actually acknowledge that, and probably partly because nobody ever quantified how much is delivered to the tissue. So we were quantifying 50% is delivered to the tissue from the arterioles. And there's lots of really cool reasons why that happens, which we'll discuss over here. Uh, but the other interesting thing... Do you think it's size related? So if, if we go to mice, it's, it's not the branching level, it's actually the size of the vessel. If, if we, sorry, if we go to humans... Yeah. It's going to be still that size. I, I, it will still be like this because this is a mechanism for oxygen reserve. Right? right. So the brain has no storage of oxygen in the tissue. So when you have increased demand for oxygen, the brain needs several tricks in order to get more oxygen to the tissue more quickly. So this is one trick. All I have to do is increase blood flow. And suddenly, all of this oxygen that was delivered from the arterioles that had diffused 200 microns is now pushed into the capillaries where it only has to diffuse 20 microns, right? So it can support much higher oxygen consumptions. So it's, it's just a fundamental mechanism of supporting higher oxygen demand, right? So to me, I, I, I'm willing to bet that you'll see the same thing in humans. Right. But, but uh, with that physical size, but is, is that a far, further down the branching level? Are there more branches in the human brain than there are in mouse brain? Oh, but these are pretty small arterials. So th these yes. are the penetrating so arterials. Okay, so these, it's these are the not size as big, opposed to right. the, the... These are not the big arterial yeah. arteries that we're Okay. Yeah. Uh, there was, there was, uh, I mentioned that there was this nice paper in PNAS, I think in 2013, where, the, where they discovered that, that the, the viable cells were within 65 microns of, of, a, of patent blood vessels. So I wonder, does that apply everywhere in the body? Or is that, do you think that's just, well, um, the, you're, you're saying this is the, the brain, brain, which is what you're talking about, in the brain, only? the intercapillary distance is like 40 to 50 microns. Right? Mm -hmm. So around capillaries, the cell is never more than 25 microns from the capillary. Right. Right. And, and how far the capillary from the neurons? So there are neurons everywhere. I, right, I understood that. Right. But is there any gap between the neurons and capillaries, or they are touching each other? So there are no capillary loops, right? That's skin. Okay. Um, well, I, I mean, you showed before the picture uh, from I understood from Maria, Angelo. So when, when you have the <coughs> the vessel, and there is the action of neurons. Yeah. And the question is. Does it mean that uh, neurons fill in the changes of blood, or blood fill in the changes of neuron activity? So how close they to each other? What is the actual distance? I think people are still getting after that question. The vascular density does vary a little bit with depth in the cortex, and it does correlate a little bit with the cellular density. That's the best answer I can give you right now. Yeah. Hey, this is, a, I guess, a phosphorus and nano curve of some sort. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, what's this temporal resolution here, and how deep can you see the two? The, um, so, we excite it at, for half a microsecond, and its lifetime is 100 microseconds. Um, so, we can repeat a measurement every few milliseconds. I'm right. We can repeat it all every once in a So there's a new probe that has a much stronger cross section, mm -hmm. and we've actually and and it's redder. So we this probe we were able to go like 400 microns deep. The new probe we were able to go 900 microns deep. I was just shocked by that. 
We just got it a month ago, so we're still playing with it. Absolutely shocked by that. But I wanted to show. Ah, uh, no, you can't make it up. <laughs> but it, it's amazing. Those arterials that dive down, there's no capillaries around them. This figure doesn't do it justice, but I have other figures that aren't here. Um, that. Uh, no, you can't really see. No, there, there's a good example. Right? And there's an example. That's an arterial, just the way that network and the brain works. All the feeding arteries on the surface of the brain, and then arterials dive down and branch into capillary networks. Where they dive down, you see no capillaries. Right? That's because it's getting oxygen from the arterial. You don't need capillaries. Um, okay. But what Martin, sorry, this was a long answer um, to what you were asking, um, was saying is, why, what about the capillaries, right? What's the oxygenation of capillaries? We were very surprised to see that the smallest venules were 40%. The larger ones are 65%. So, you know, physicists are like simple things. A vascular network, I have an artery, it feeds a capillary, it feeds a vein. I have high oxygenation, lower oxygenation, lower oxygenation. How could I have high oxygenation really low oxygenation, and then it comes up. Just, it, I don't have conservation of oxygen. Well, it turns out um, we have a network of capillaries. It's not a single capillary, right? And, and so it turns out there are some capillaries with very high flow that have a short transit time, don't deliver much oxygen, and so they, they, they have a lot of oxygen right, in the blood. Then you have other capillaries, and this appears to be the majority of capillaries that have long transit times. They deliver a lot of oxygen to the tissue. When you get into the veins, it's a flow-weighted average. And so all of those low oxygenated capillaries are now diluted by these very few number of high-flow capillaries that have a lot of oxygen. And that's why we see, you know, as capillaries come together, the oxygenation actually goes up. And when we look at the histogram of the capillaries, you know, here's the venous SO2, the vast majority of capillaries are way below that. Right. And the only reason the venous is higher is because we have a few capillaries that are highly oxygenated, you know, um, uh, draining into the veins. Do you have so shots? this, to me, is another reserve mechanism. So this we would now have to prove. So the idea would be, it's not exactly an AV shunt, it's more like a capillary thoroughfare. You have a few capillary thoroughfares where there's a lot of blood going through them, and I can imagine, um, this definitely has to be proved, um, that in times of need, all you need to do is somehow choke those thoroughfares. And all of that oxygen now will go to the rest of the capillaries and, and, and deliver the oxygen to where it's needed. So physiologically, it makes a ton of sense. I'm taking bets um, if anyone wants to bet, because uh, I think we'll be able to prove this. So what would be the origin of the fact that nature didn't create this reserve of oxygen in the brain? Why, why, is, why would that be? Could it be that the brain is the controller, and therefore uh, it, it preserves the oxygen for itself first, and everything else has a lower priority? And, and therefore, it evolves not to needs. I can only really imagine that you know the brain is incredibly complex. If you had other large molecules there storing oxygen, it would just interfere with all of the other complex mechanisms going on. Right? That maybe is the first first that thought that comes to mind. So that if someone in the brain, because all these chemicals you know are interacting between all these cells. <coughs> Anything there to store oxygen would interfere with all of these chemicals as well. Yeah. If someone feels the pain, as you mentioned, even so, did this change the parameter? Um, so you get a blood flow response. So we haven't measured this during a brain activation response. So during brain activation, you know, the oxygenation actually increases a lot in the capillaries. It increases a lot. <laughs> Okay, I got the thumbs up from our sound engineers, Captain Mansko, Ludwig, and uh, Peter, I think. Uh, so I think we're good to go with some music up there.
David, uh, it's been an extraordinary tour through uh, the brain and diffuse optics. Thank you very much for that. And uh, thanks, thanks everybody here. As, as you go back out, you might note, you might see that there's lots of street lights across the bay. Uh, that's Galway. We'll be going there on Friday. Um, and since David mentioned MRI there, um, one of my predecessors, Joseph Larmour, is responsible for the Larmour equation. He was former professor of physics in, in Galway. Was, uh, that very simple equation that has three letters, I love them, uh, so that relates um, the frequency, processing frequency, to the, um, to the, the properties of the, of the material and the 